Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Fowler. Uh, Natalie Tyler, I represent Mr. Gibson. Um, the boys turned five in October, correct? Correct. Okay. And they're in pre-K at the Suzuki school? Correct. All right. And that goes through kindergarten, correct? Just through pre-K. Pre-K. Okay. So they will definitely be going to another school after they complete this semester, correct? Correct. Um, and you are presently employed? Correct. Your attorney previously admitted uh, P21, and I am going to share my screen. Perfect. Okay. Um, Ms. Fowler, this is your previously entered P21, and this is your paycheck dated December 29th, 2023? Correct. This is your last paycheck of the year? Correct. Okay. And your income is 210800 for the year? Correct. Okay. And that comes out to be approximately 17566 a month? Correct. Okay. So that's a little bit more than what was on your financial affidavit? Correct. Okay. Um. Regarding the kids' medical insurance, you testified earlier you are covering the children's medical, dental, and vision currently through employment? Yes. Okay. And I believe your financial affidavit states you pay $262 for the health insurance? Correct. About 11 for dental and 3 for vision? Correct. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work-related child care expenses and just child care expenses in general. <clears throat> um, so you're, you've, you've obviously updated your financial affidavit throughout this case. And in August of 2023, you provided a financial affidavit listing your child care expenses at $315.66 per month. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and your January 18th, 24 financial affidavit lists your child care expenses at $2,046.25 a month. That's correct. Um, I think that was an error on my part at the time. It did not include um, the, the cost of the au pair. Okay, and can you tell us what does that $2,046 a month cover? Is that the au pair plus something else, or is it au pair aftercare? Tell us what the breakdown of that is. It's primarily the au pair. So there is a, um, a program fee that you have to pay in order to have an au pair place with your family. That's roughly, I think it's about 10,000 or so. Um, and then there is a um, weekly stipend of $215 per week. Um, in addition to that, I covered her cell phone um, so that I was able to communicate her with her um, for the benefit of the children. Um, and I also had to include her on my car insurance so that she could transport them to and from school. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit uh, towards extra groceries um, for her, for her living, living expenses. Okay. So you do have an a live in au pair currently? No. So her, um, her uh, year ended in July of 2023. Um, so, um, just given all of the expenses I've been incurring for, for this case, I haven't been able to afford to um, get another au pair. Okay, so you're not currently incurring this 2046 a month in childcare? Not currently, no. Okay, what are you currently incurring for childcare? Um, let me see if I can pull up my... I think that it's probably roughly 400 to 500. Let me see. For in addition to the the school, I'd say if you look at um, the worksheet that I uh, um, for 2023, um, you'd see that in August it was about 190, um, September 206, October 577. So it's it's kind of fluctuated anywhere between 200 to to 600 dollars um, for extra child care on um, nights and weekends. So currently you are incurring about between 200 and 600 a month in childcare costs relating to evenings and weekends. Correct. Okay. So that does not include aftercare? It does sometimes include aftercare. Okay. 
And that is night care and weekend care is not work related, correct? That's not while you're working. Uh, sometimes I do have to work in, during nights and weekends. Okay. What do you do for a living, Ms. Fowler? I work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. I'm the um, director of the Capital and Liquidity Risk Team. Um, so, you know, there's times when there, you know, I do need to work on weekends, especially if we have a bank failure happening or bank failures that might have implications for the firms that we supervise. Okay. Um. And earlier you testified, you know, Mr. Gibson pays you 2000 a month in work-related child care costs currently, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and up until last year, 2023, you were not providing reimbursement requests. He was just voluntarily providing the 2000 a month for work-related child care, correct? Uh, that's not correct. I've always provided reimbursement requests. Okay. But in some months... Mr. Gibson has actually overpaid for your work-related child care, correct? No. Okay. Is all of your child care costs, the 200 to 600, is all of that work-related or is some of that personal time? Some of that is, I would say, personal time just because I um, don't, because Mr. Gibson is not exercising his visitation. Okay. I'm going to show you what was previously admitted as P9. Uh, this, this is your overview of childcare expenses or child expenses, not just childcare, correct? Correct. Okay. And I'm just going to zoom, zoom in a little bit because I'm a little bit blind and I'm, I'm sure everyone else wants to see this as well. Um, you've got here at the bottom this 57,560 number. That's what you've spent. And you've got this 25,565 number. And that's what Mr. Gibson has spent according to your math, correct? Correct. Okay. This does not reflect Mr. Gibson's child support payments, does it? No. Okay. So he pays an additional 1585 per month on top of this, correct? That's correct. Okay. So that's an additional, what, uh, $19,020 per year? Um, I, I assume that's the correct math. Yeah, no problem. Um, I don't expect you to, to do the math in your head, but so if you add this 19,000, to the 25,000, that comes to be 44,585 a year, not 25,565, correct? Uh, I believe so. Okay. And you're, I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'm going to share your P18, which was your financial affidavit. So you, you testified about your retirement savings. Um, you also have savings cash savings in about in the amount of 16,000. Um, I think that's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then you've got a home with about 385,000 of equity. Roughly. Okay. And you have no debt, no credit cards, or I think you have. No, one. I have okay. So you're paying 553 a month for debt. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And you testified earlier that the summer camp expenses that were reflected as 10,000 on your financial affidavit were actually closer to 7,000, correct? Correct. Is there anything else that's been inflated on your financial affidavit? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, earlier you testified that Mr. Gibson has not paid you anything above and beyond what the court has ordered him to, to pay you? Um, I said that in 2023, correct. Okay. But he has actually helped you with some additional expenses. For example, he paid $1,800 to fix your furnace. Uh, in my old house? 
I'm asking you. Um, so no, I don't recall him sending money for my furnace at my old place. Okay. He's split the cost of artificial turf in your current home with you. And that was about $6,000 out of pocket for him. That's correct. Um, when Mr. Gibson came to visit, he indicated that um, I should think about putting a um, trampoline in the backyard. And I told him at the time that I could not because we didn't have enough um, grass in the backyard to cover it. And, and then I mentioned my plans to install artificial turf, which would actually expand the yard um, space back there. Um, at that time, Mr. Gibson volunteered to to pay for half of the turf. Okay. okay, so I want to move on to Suzuki and private school. Um, your financial affidavit says you pay seventeen ninety per month for tuition for both kids at Suzuki right now. Is that correct? Um, yes, subtracting out the two thousand um, that Mr. Gibson pays. Yes. So it's about thirty seven ninety a month total. Correct. Correct. Um, the kids started there in June of twenty one. That's correct. So they were two years old at that time. Yes, two turning three. Okay. And you mentioned the babies can't wait evaluations that were done in December of twenty twenty. Um, the results of those evaluations were that Grayson qualified for speech and OT but Hendricks did not qualify, correct? That's correct. Um, my understanding is that for the state of Georgia, that they primarily look for differences um, that are higher than a certain standard deviation. And so for that time, Hendricks did not qualify for services. Okay. And then you had a developmental evaluation through DeKalb County when the kids were three, correct? Correct. Hendricks did not qualify for services, but Grayson was recommended for a special education inclusive preschool preschool placement. Is that correct? Correct. Um, Hendricks didn't do a full evaluation at that time. They um, just did a, a screener, um, but did not do the full evaluation that it did for Grayson. But yes, he did not. He passed that screener. Okay. And then December 21, Grayson has educational psychological evaluation. Um, and was determined to not be autistic, correct? Correct. And I understand that you have researched uh, the Cap County public school options for the boys, correct? Correct. And again, Grayson did qualify for uh, services, and you you actually went so far as to create an IEP with DeKalb County. Correct. Okay. Um. And you later, you, you declined services through DeKalb County. Correct. Um, for several reasons at the time. Um, one being that I felt that his needs would be best served where he was, was currently. Um, I'd spoken to the special education teacher um, who reached out to me and we had a conversation about um, the curriculum and um, how, um, you know, how, how the children are taught. Um, she actually asked me, well, um, is he an inclusive se setting right now, meaning with neurotypical peers? And I said, yes. She asked. Objection. I'm sorry. D don't testify to what somebody else told you. Sure. Fine. Um, she indicated that. Your, your, your Honor, I, I believe Attorney Tyler opened up the door when she asked her specifically, did you uh, did you decline the services? And I believe my client is providing her with the reason on why she's declining those services. And so I think if you're going to ask her a question, she should be given the opportunity to, to answer the question that's being directly asked. Yeah, but the same token, I mean, if she can answer the question without presenting hearsay, she should do so. Okay. Um, and it wasn't a why. It was a, did you decline? That's That was the answer. Um, I did decline um, for a number of reasons. Okay. Um, but services are, in fact, available through DeKalb County. Uh, yes. Um, I'd have to reactivate his IEP. But yes, um, I think the evaluation is um, valid for three years. Okay. So DeKalb County does offer IEPs, obviously. They also offer 504 plans. Correct. Okay. Um, 
And again, neither child has been diagnosed with autism or dyslexia, correct? Um, not at this time, no. Okay. The kids are, again, five years old, right? Correct. And how many evaluations have the kids have since had since they were two? Oh, I don't know. Um, I have to look at the, the actual PowerPoint to quantify, but quite a few, um, particularly more so, I would say, Grayson. Could it be about six or seven evaluations? Yeah. Okay. Your P6 had several options that you were considering for private school. Um, I believe the lowest cost on there was St. Martin's at $23,000 per child per year. Is that right? That's um, if they are not in the Kairos um, program, which is the school within the school, where they would actually have their needs supported if they were dyslexic. But in, of the options you presented on P6, um, except for the public school, this without the in, a school within a school, St. Martin's base would be the cheapest though, correct? It would, but that would not actually be addressing their needs. And then the highest price school, I believe, was the Howard School, and that was $39,000 per child per year? Correct. I believe so. Okay. And you testified earlier that upon meeting them, a layperson would not necessarily know that they have any difficulties. Correct. Okay. How much have you paid in attorney's fees to date? Um, I believe it's in the range of 30000 And how much did you pay your expert witness? Um, 400 I suppose. I mean, you mean... You might get a bill following. Might get a bill, yeah, for today. Um, nothing further subject to recross. I'm going to call Mr. Walter Gibson. Well, Your Honor, I'm sorry. Before I do that. Do you have any questions for Ms. Fowler? No, Your Honor. I did prior to moving on from Ms. Fowler. My, we did provide opposing counsel with our um, proposed, Your Honor, child support addendum and child support worksheet, which is Petitioner's mm -hmm. Exhibit 27 and Petitioner's mm -hmm. Exhibit 28. Okay. And any objections, Ms. Fowler, to those? Uh, no objections to those. Okay. All right, then. So admit it. Yes, Your and, Honor. I don't have any additional questions at this time, um, subject to uh, direct at a later time, Your Honor. All right. Call your next witness. Thank you. Mr. Gibson, In uh, on June 4th, 2019, my client and you mediated a parenting plan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then 26 day days later on June 30th of 2019, you informed her you were actually moving out of the state to Missouri. Is that correct? Yes. And you informed her that you had at that point had no address on where you were going. Is that correct? Yes. And after you moved out of the state in 2019, did you have any other visitations with the boys for that year? I cannot say that I recall. And 2020, did you have any visitation with the boys? Possibly. Okay. 2021? 2021, I'm sure I did. Okay. 2022? Likely. Okay. And if, if it's likely, how many visits do you believe that you've had in 2022? This would be a guess, maybe two to three. Okay. And in 2023, how many visits did you have with the boys? None. Yeah. Now, is there a reason why you have not had any visits with the boys in 2023? Yes. What, what's the reason? Uh, there's several. Uh, hostility between me and Hillary, Hillary made it different, difficult. Uh, the fact that I was in uh, Missouri was, was problematic. Uh, concern about my safety was a concern. Did you recall alleging making any of those allegations in your answer to the modification? 
Did you I, do you I, call I, making any representation of any hostility, safety issues, I, or concerns? I, I don't recall. I don't recall being asked that question. Well, I'm asking about your your answer that you filed. Did you allege any allegations of any safety concerns that you had regarding my client? No. Did you re recall stating in your answer having any concerns about hostility between you and my client in your answer? Proactively, no. It was never asked. Okay. Do you recall making any representation in your discovery responses about any hostility or safety concerns? No questions in that document, so no. Okay. So no questions were asked, but you did not provide the information on why you didn't have any visits. Is that correct? correct. Objection, compound question. Okay. I'll move on from that, Your Honor. So okay. in what exactly are you alleging as far as hostility that would prohibit you from having visitation? Well, there were several times where uh, when I first moved to Missouri, because of my work schedule and the demands of the job, uh, I wasn't able to confirm absolutely when I was going to come and how long I'd be able to have the kids. So what I would do is when my travel schedule or I was available to come to Atlanta, I would provide at least five, five to seven days of notice that I'd be in town and request to see the boys. There was one time where the time frame was shorter. Never once did I demand I'm coming to town. I need to see the boys. I was always courteous in terms of if you guys are available, I'd love to come by and see the boys. There was an instance, there was an instance where I was told, and this, this has something to do with why I haven't been around in 2023. I was told this schedule is not going to work for me anymore. You, you, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do the, you call me five to seven days and just have, you need to take them for the whole weekend. And I just simply couldn't commit to that. And the conversation got very heated. It got very heated. And this ties into my safety. This got very heated to the point where I told uh, Hillary, you're going to have to be careful in terms of the way that you talk to me. Because some of her some of her language was laced with profanity and the tone of the voice just wasn't one that I thought was respectful. Uh, she then in turn, when I said, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the way you talk to me, you, you got to you know talk to me in, in a little bit more respectful manner. Her response was, is that a threat? So when I hear that, I know the next step. She feels threatened, calls the cops. I've never been incarcerated or arrested, anything along those lines, and wasn't interested in that type of drama. So that's interesting, Mr. Gibson, because we attended mediation in May of 2023. Do you recall that? I do. And do you recall making any allegations about any safety issues, any hostility, any concerns about threats? What occurred in mediation is a confidential process and settlement negotiations should not be entered into evidence today. And Your Honor, that typically is the case. However, if the mediation resulted in a consent parenting plan that reflected what the parties believed was the agreement and were I believe it's appropriate to ask if that was included in regards to that. So I think I could lead up to asking that question relating to this matter, Your Honor. Oh, you mean what was so that mediation led to what you've already presented to the court? It is, Your Honor. And I'll allow it. Do you recall in that mediation ever making any representations that you wanted reflected specifically in the parenting plan order, any safety parameters, police stations, third party um, exchanges in public places for exchanges. Do you recall making any of those representations for it to be then memorialized in a, in the parenting plan? The parenting plan in terms of, of its memorialization was I was entitled to visitation rights as opposed to obligated. But to answer your question directly, no. And why, if you had a concern about your safety, would you not? I wasn't asked about that. In, in mediation, why would you have had to be asked about that if that was something that you could have explored putting into the document? because the uh, parenting plan was entitled to see the boys as opposed to obligated. If the plan was obligated, then that would have triggered me to say, I can't commit to that. At this moment in time, I don't feel safe. Moving forward, I don't know how I'll feel with Hillary six months from now, three months from now, don't know. But at the time, the parenting plan, as I understood it, was entitled to see the boys. So you weren't aware that- that oh, You never had any intentions to see them? I do have intentions to, to, to see them at that, that moment in time. I was not comfortable seeing them. I'm, I'm confused. It has nothing to do with time. You knew at the time that you did not feel comfortable enough to see your children and you let a plan go through that would almost ensure you wouldn't see them. 
it, I didn't view it as ensuring I wouldn't see them. I viewed it. I had, I had the entitlement to see them. And as a, if my comfort was subsided, then certainly I'd make more of an effort to see them. What's your, what's your educational background, Mr. Gibson? Sales marketing. Education. Did you go to college? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Bachelor of Science. So, and you thought that you, you paid an attorney on an issue dealing with legitimation of your children. And you left out of there understanding that you did not feel comfortable visiting your children and you didn't tell anyone that you didn't feel comfortable visiting your, your children to the I extent didn't. that for three years you didn't bother to try to see them. You didn't think that was odd. It was, it was uncomfortable and still is not being able to see my boys, but the history that I have with Mrs. Fowler has made it very challenging for me to do that comfortably. So what do you anticipate that's going to change if you never say anything? Well, what I anticipate is being able to move out of this apartment into a house and have some form of a liaison between me and closer to, to the boys and have a liaison between me and Hillary so I don't have to deal with her directly. And you didn't think of that two years ago or three years ago? You just just mm -hmm. now? Not not while living in St. Louis. I knew my, my opportunities to travel weren't going to be guaranteed when I'd be able to see them. And it was relegated to four week, one week and a quarter. Okay. You may continue. And so if I understand you correctly, your position is you're just going to file another modification? I and I'm sorry, and I just want to get additional clarification because you have this agreement. That's what it sounds like. Because, <laughs> I mean, we're not dealing with it now. No one's brought it up. We, I've gone through openings. No one mentioned anything. So I don't know. Thank but you. Mr. Gibson, you, you're, 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 um, you're frustrating your opportunities. You've had all of this time and you're talking about something no one's ever heard of. Because... You, you sat through, I'm sure, several of the matters that came before you and you understood, I would imagine you have a bachelor's degree, that if you need to put certain parameters in place so that you would have access to your children, that that was possible. I just don't understand how you could spend that amount of time away from your children. And now all of a sudden, the first thing you out your mouth is that you were threatened to the extent you need a liaison, but you didn't want to put the liaison in place over the last three years, I don't understand that because we could have dealt with the liaison in 2019 and 2020 or, or 2021 or 2022. And then now 2024 is when you mention the only reason you haven't seen them because you're afraid and you need, you need a liaison. I, I don't know what happened. Judge, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I, I've lost confidence in, in the process. I'll go back to our first agreement and Hillary had committed to providing me with the name and phone number of the babysitter so I could have contact through the boys that way. I already knew that we didn't get along and we weren't going to have healthy dialogue. That was agreed upon in mediation. She refused after the mediation agreement was done to provide me with that detail. Well, we came back to mediation, Mr. Gibson, in 2023. I wasn't a part of 2019, but I was a part of 2023. And this year's this case has been lingering on for 14 months now. And so at that point, you had an opportunity to convey and communicate that you had concerns about my client and whatever you believe were safety issues and threats so it could have been addressed. And so I think the confusion everyone is having now is this is the first time that it's ever been represented in any capacity that there's been any safety issues or concerns relating to why you have not had any visitation. In all fairness, you asked me. So I gave you the answer. Right. So if we didn't ask you, you these kids would never see their dad because no, there would be not nothing true. to play. Well, when would, when would we put the liaison in place if we're not doing it today? When I'm able to move out of St. Louis, that was my plan. Oh, you're going to refile again? Yeah. At that point, it would make you, sense because I'd be in a better, I'd be in a better position to see my boys. You, you might need to have some conversation with your lawyer because I don't think you understand how this works and that there's finances attached to this. You're going to march Miss Fowler back into court over something you could take care of today? Who's going to pay for those fees when you march her back in? Whenever it's more comfortable for you, who's going to pay for it? When do you plan on leaving out of St. Louis? I hope you're telling me two years from now, because that's the only time we're going to address it. 
Yeah, I wouldn't look to come back to court tomorrow. It would be after two years for sure. So these kids are going to be without their dad for two years because you don't want to say, let's put a liaison in place. And you moving out, what does you moving have to do with you seeing them? You could come into town and have a liaison, take them to the hotel for a weekend. She, you, she's, you already, it, right? she's, she's already told me that the way that I would be able to operate in terms of when I come to town, if it doesn't fit a schedule that is fixed, that's not. You know work. what? You you, you 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 can't believe that. Why do you have Miss Tyler there if everything Miss Fowler says is going to be the law? Why are you here? That doesn't even make sense. You have a lawyer so that she can advocate for you. If you need to be able to see your boys, to be able to take them on a weekend to a hotel, Miss Tyler would tell me my my client wants to take the boys on the weekend to the hotel. And then you and I, we have this hearing and then voila, you get to take the kids on the weekends to the hotel. But you're never gonna get that if you never ask it. And I feel sorry for the boys that go for years without seeing them because they're waiting for you to get a to, waiting for you to get a house when they're like eight years old. I don't, I don't get that. I'm gonna take a moment, I need a break. Ms. Fowler and Ms. Hinkson, let me see your video so I know you're ready so we can get started. All right, there we go. Yes, All, right. All right, um, you may continue. Thank you. You currently said you live in Missouri, is that correct? Yes. Um, in an apartment? Yes. How many bedrooms? Two. And how long have you lived in this apartment? Since August of 2019. Is the second room set up to house the boys, have the boys come for a visit? No. Did you ever intend the boys to come for a visit in Missouri? Uh, in my mind, yes, but wasn't sure given the situation we talked about. And so if you knew 26 days after the consent parenting plan that you were moving out of state, then why did you agree to every other weekend visitation? During, during the time of that agreement, I wasn't sure I was moving out of state. So there was no interviews, there was no meetings, none, none of that happened? Yeah, absolutely there were interviews. Okay, so there was there was a potential that you were moving out of state, is that correct? It was up in the air. The person that was making the hiring decision had to decide if they wanted the role to sit in St. Louis or not, but told me it was a possibility. It was early on in the process, wasn't sure if I was going to get the job, so did not know for sure until the offer was made. And did you ever communicate to Ms. Hillary? Uh, to Hillary about the potential move out of state prior to it taking place? We were not communicating at the time, no. Did you? Okay. Now you mentioned in your answer that you are unemployed, is that correct? That is. And when did you become unemployed? September 15th of 2022, I believe. I'm sorry, you said September 15th of 2022? Yes. Okay. And do you recall when this case was filed? I don't know the exact date. Would it surprise you that around the time, around that time is when the case was filed? No, I think it was somewhere in that neighborhood. It would not surprise me. Okay. And do you recall ever stating to my client that um, when you moved, um, when you had lost your job, that it would in no way affect your abilities to care for the children? Do you recall having that kind of communications with her? I can't say I recall it, but clearly by the fact that I've still been paying, it has not impacted me paying what I pay today. Okay. And you and Miss Fowler actually registered on Our Family Wizard. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so is that how you guys maintain communications? Uh. She communicates me in one of three ways, either via email, our family wizard, or via text. Okay. And so from September of 2022 until present, are you still stating uh, for the purposes of court today that you are unemployed? Yes. Okay. Let, and and let, uh, I'd like to add to that. Unless you consider the private contract work that I do uh, when opportunities present themselves employed, then I would say unemployed. Does, does someone hire you to consult or what exactly are you doing when you say when you're given the opportunities um, relating to the, that job? I have one 
of four, and I may be missing one organization, but there's an organization called GuidePoint, one called Third Bridge, one called Anthonym, another one called Coleman and Associates. And I'm in each of their databases. So when there's a subject matter that comes up that's consistent with my expertise, uh, they will send me the project and have me answer some questions. Uh, I will then send that information back to them. They have a litany of other individuals they can that they consider. Uh, and then they determine whether or not uh, after they speak to their client, that there's someone that, uh, that that I would be the one that they would consult with. Okay. And so how frequently have you been doing that since November, excuse me, September of 2022? I've been in the database for each of them at, at a minimum from December of 22 to current. Okay. And how frequent are you receiving assignments? I'd say once every three weeks to a month in terms of me being hired. I get I get projects sent to me probably on a weekly basis. I'm selected maybe once every three weeks to a month. And how many projects are you sent on a weekly basis? I would say on average, sometimes one, two at the most. A week? Yes. So a total of roughly around four or five projects for the month? A at the most. Okay. And is there a reason why you're not selecting all of those projects since you're unemployed? No, I, I select the ones that I have the level of expertise in. If someone sends me a project and they look at my resume and for some reason think that I'm a fit for engineering, I would decline it and say I don't have the relevant expertise. Okay. And how much is paid for these projects? Uh, it could be as little as 300 and as much as 500. Okay. And that's for the hour. So if uh, if just say, for example, there's a project that uh, the agreement is for 500 for the hour and they only go a half hour, then I would be paid 250. Now, you submitted in February of 2023 a temporary DRFA. Is that correct? Do you, do you know what that is? Domestic Relations Financial Affidavit? Yes. OK. And do you recall what amount you stated was your monthly expenses in February of 2023? I don't have that committed to memory. Okay. And Attorney Tyler is, I have- I'm Sorry. Can you all want, wait one quick second? One second. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. And I have it listed as petitioners, petitioners exhibit 12, which is um, Mr. Gibson's February 10th, 2023, temporary domestic relations financial affidavit. Um, is there any objections to me tendering that into evidence as petitioners 12? No, Judge, or no, Ms. Hinkson, sorry. I understand. No. This is from, so now we're uh, roughly around you being unemployed since November, 2022, and then you submitted this in February of 2022. So you mentioned your gross income here is $104, correct? Yes. Yet you have $15,068 in expenses monthly. Is that correct? That seems about right. Okay. And you listed no additional incomes, no other funds, no any of those things listed under the part as far as income. Is that correct? Correct. And so when we go to accounts, at that point, you had $25,000 in a savings, $9,000 in a check-in, $272,287.70 in an MM account, $39,376.77 in a E-Trade IRA rollover account, $147,060.97 in an E-Trade Roth IRA account and $353,746.01 in a E-Trade individual account. Is that correct? That looks right. Okay. You have a $70,000 at that point, $70,000 2020 Audi. Is that correct? Correct. A $28,000 2021 Jeep Cherokee. Is that correct? Correct. $28,000 in jewelry, $17,000 in furnitures. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Is that Audi paid off? Yes. When did you pay that Audi off? Uh, 
estimated March of 2021. Okay. So March, 2021, you paid $70,000 for an Audi, correct? Uh, no, that's the, the value of it today. Okay. So then how much did you pay for it? Uh, with taxes, 107,000. Let me, I'm sorry, $104,000? 107,000 back in, back in 2020 when I first purchased it. Finance okay. then paid the car off okay. in March of 2021. So if I understand correctly, you paid $107,000 off for the hot Audi total, okay. correct? No. Okay. What, what I'm saying is that there's a down payment. Uh, the total cost of the car was $107,000. I made a down payment of approximately $20,000. And in 2021, whatever, 20, March of 2021, approximately, whatever the balance was, I paid that off then. March 2021. All right. And then this 2021 Jeep Cherokee, $28,000 was the value in March of 2023. How much was that car? 38000 38000 Is this car paid off? Yes. And when did you pay this one off? Uh, that was paid off at the point of sale. Uh that may have been May or June of 2021, if my memory serves me correctly. Estimate. So, so two months after you you paid over, put roughly around sixty to seventy thousand dollars for your Audi, you turned around two months later and paid thirty eight thousand dollars for this 2021 Jeep Cherokee. Is that correct? That is correct. And your mortgage is, or rent is $3,300. Is that correct? That is correct. And let's briefly go. So then there's a part that says $1,800 in interest on other expenses. What are you paying $1,800 in on interest for? That may be a typo. Let me think about that one for a second. Okay. All right. So now we went from your temporary one in February of 2023. And then right before our hearing, you submitted one in August of 2023. Is that correct? Sorry, say that again. What did I submit? You submitted an updated domestic relations financial affidavit in August of 2023. Okay. That sounds about right. Okay. I have that marked as petitioners exhibit 17. Um, is there any objections to me submitting that into evidence? No objection. Okay. So now we, roughly around five or six months later, you updated um, your DRFA. So now let's look at these numbers again. So your income went from $104 to $631. Is that correct? Looks about right. And you have about $13,868 in expenses. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you net $441. Is that correct? That looks correct. Okay. So now let's go down to these same accounts again. Yep. So in February, we had that first account, which was your I'm just gonna be honest of 2023 that individual account that was three thousand five hundred three thousand fifty three dollars and seventy four cents in August went up to five thousand seven hundred and twenty dollars. Is that correct? Sorry, where am I looking? So you're looking right here. So at your previous the previous February 2023 showed yes. this amount right here being $3,053.746.01. You mean okay. $300,000? 300, yes, $300,000. Excuse me, $353,746. That's correct. Okay. Six months, well, less than six months, it increased to $573,720. Is that correct? That is correct. We have a $219,973 increase from this individual account. Is this correct? That is correct. Is this a liquid account? Are you able to access this money? Yes. Okay. So this is liquid assets, correct? Yes. Okay. 
Now that same the same amount we had in February of 2023, this E-Trade Roth IRA was valued at $147,060. And in August, it was valued at $192,822.16. Is that correct? That is correct. So that was a $45,761.19 increase within six months, correct? Correct. Or is this liquid assets as well? No. Okay. And so how how is this money? Um, are you able to physically withdraw from, from this account? No. Okay. And so this account is just, what, how how is it, where is it established at? Is it a part of a retirement? Kind of express, explain to the court how, where this money is. It is, it is you, you have the IRA Roth rollover along with the IRA rollover along with the Roth IRA are both 401k retirement accounts. The Roth is a post-tax contribution. The uh, rollover IRA is a pre-tax contribution. If you're one, trying to understand why the fluctuations, uh, each of these accounts are invested in stocks, so they ebb and flow up and down on a weekly, monthly, daily basis. Okay. So these are stocks that you have, correct? These are, these are retirement accounts and in individual accounts, the funds are invested in stocks. Okay. And then we have the MMA account that was $181,945. Are you able to, is this liquid assets? Are you able to withdraw from this account? Yes. Okay. And then the $11,541, you're able to withdraw from that account as well? Yes. Okay. And in uh, 2022, you filed taxes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And I have this listed as Petitioner's Exhibit 13. It is the Respondent's 2022 tax returns. Any objections to that tax return? No objection. All right. So admit it. Hold on one second. Please. So this is what I have marked as Petitioner's Exhibit 13, the Respondent's 2022 tax return. So your adjusted gross income for 2022 was $1.2 million. Thousand five hundred and thirty-three dollars. Is that correct? Yes. Just want to see the whole exhibit, the total. Okay. What, what was the end up? The end amount? That was, oh, that was the adjusted. Okay, never mind. Yes, your honor. Okay. And you also submitted your twenty twenty one tax returns. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Your honor, I have that as petitioner's exhibit fourteen, respondents twenty twenty one tax returns. Okay. And 2021, your adjusted gross income was $946,004. Is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, I have Petitioner's Exhibit 15, Respondent's 2020 tax return. And this is a copy of it, but it's of roughly around $418,191. Is that correct? Yes. And please, Your Honor, let me know. Or Attorney Tyler, okay. if you need to slow down on... Yeah, I have it. Thank you. Okay. I have it. Mm -hmm. Now, in this year, 2024, you submitted a updated DRFA. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so as of this year, you're still alleging $631 as your monthly income and $13,951 as expenses. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And is there a reason why you did not include these accounts that are liquid um, to your, your income, to the portion that's listed as your income? If they're in accounts and they're sitting and I'm not drawing any money to me, I didn't understand that would be considered income. Okay. And so this account, the E-Trade account that you physically have access to has now increased to $629,384. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So just for my own clarification, because I did not know, an E-Trade account that you don't take anything out of that you're investing in is considered income? Your well, Honor, I don't ask any questions right now. Okay. <clears throat> and so you have these monthly expenses, which is totaling around $13,000, but you're stating that you're only making roughly... $631. So it's, can you explain to us how you are maintaining this life if you're only making $631? Uh, I've had to spend down my income, my savings. 
Okay. And which account would that be? That would be a combination of the Kemba accounts. So the combination of these three accounts. That is correct. All right. So not only do you have, as far as the E-Trade, as far as liquid assets, that's to your disposable, 629384000 dollars You also have these three accounts, one that has 110000 another one that has 2200 and then another one that has $320.17. Is that correct? That's partially correct. The E-Trade accounts, because they're stocks, there's some that I'm taking a loss on that I would not take access to. Okay. And this Bank of America account that you say that you have $464.05, have you actually physically provided the entire bank statement relating to this matter? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I have what's marked as Petitioner's Exhibit P26 and then P26, subsection A, Respondent's Bank of America bank account. Mr. Gibson, are are these are these bank statements? Is this a bank statement or is, a, or is this a screenshot? The picture that you're showing me is a screenshot. Are you are you aware that this is the only documentation that I re received for this bank account? I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I thought I sent over the actual account. Okay. When do you recall sending over the actual account? Respectfully, those were provided in discovery last week. This is what was provided in discovery last week. So I'm I'm asking the difference between a bank statement, an entire bank statement, and a screenshot. So there were additional documents included uh, that were his Bank of America actual statements. If you could provide that to me, I, I have a comp compilation of screenshots. So I and I will reserve that, Your Honor, to come back to that line of questioning. All right, we'll come back to that line of questioning. Why don't you, Ms. Tyler, try to look and see what you recall sending over to Now, you mentioned that you have applied to over 270 jobs. Is that correct? That is. Okay. And how are you applying for those jobs? Uh, there's a uh, query that I have set up that has the actual job description that fits my skill set. And the LinkedIn vehicle, LinkedIn vehicle sends me uh, updates on any organizations that have positions relative to my skill set and the parameters that I set up. Okay. And are you aware you so you so you're mostly doing it through LinkedIn, is that correct? That's the line share, not all, but the line share. Okay. And so where else are you uh, where else have you explored as far as employment? I've done some on LinkedIn, I've done some on Expert Tier. I have Six recruiters that I work with directly. One is called Hendrickson, Hendrickson Struggles, specialized in executive searches. John Keller is a recruiter I work directly with. Maddie Gray, I actually have a meeting with her tomorrow for an opportunity. Bree Coulter is another executive recruiter. Joe Garfield is a recruiter, executive recruiter. Holden and Associates uh, is a consultant firm that also does recruiting work. Those are all of the resources that I use from a recruiting standpoint. Okay. And I've is there, okay. I work with all, all of them in 2023. Okay. Perfect. And is there any reason why you did not provide that as a part of your um, evidence as far as your job searches? If I can recall, the inquiry was a proof of applying for jobs. I don't recall being asked of the resources uh, relative to recruiting firms that I'm using. Okay. Otherwise, I'd be more than happy to supply it. You, you do know that you provide LinkedIn proof of employment searches, correct? Yeah, but it showed the actual job I was applying for. These are recruiters that I'm not applying for the actual, I haven't applied for the job. They're talking to me about the job. Okay. And are you aware that your LinkedIn profile still states that you are currently employed as a senior vice president for Newsly? No, I did not know that. I thought that was updated. Okay. And so you provided screenshots of your job inquiries and you weren't aware that it still showed that you're currently employed? I was not even looking at my profile. When when the job links come to me, they come standalone. But what if, if you're applying on LinkedIn, would it not be important to make sure that you're going through your profile and other documents on LinkedIn to make sure that it's reflective? I actually of, thought of, that it was up to date. That's my, my I looked over it. That's, that one's on me. Okay. So, so you're not currently employed, although it states that, correct? Correct. I need to go and update that. And, and that wouldn't I'm show- I'm sorry. One, one second, please. Okay. 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 So we left off at where I was asking specifically about your LinkedIn profile. Um, and so are you aware that your profile is also still linked at, um, to Newsling as you being an employer? You just mentioned that. I mentioned it was my oversight. I need to update that. 
Okay. But what I meant, so what I'm mentioning is also that you're also on their page is currently still being employed. Or were you aware of that? I was not. Let's jump back a little bit. So can you tell me, um, and we're going to kind of just work this backwards. So would you say in the last 20 years, you've been gainfully employed? So yeah. it's 2000. Yes. So 2004 until present, you've been gainfully employed. Is that correct? Correct. Has there any has there been any lapse in employment outside of this time frame from November of 2022 to present? 2022 to present. A small a small lapse from Equifax to New Zealand. OK. And how small was that? Like three months. Three months. So in the last 20 years, you've only had a lapse of employment going from one employment to another for three months. And from 2022 until present has been the longest lap. Is that correct? No. Uh, there was also a lapse uh, between, this is a while ago, from ADP to EMC of six months. Okay. But nothing 14 months, correct? No. Okay. And so now let's talk about, let's go back a little bit. So how much were you, when did you start Equifax? July 1 of 2019. And you were there for how long? Approximately two and a half years, give or take a month. And when you started, what was your salary? 275000 And was there any bonuses? What year was that, the two seventy five? That was uh, when I was hired into Equifax, July 1 of 2019. And so when you left at Equifax, you said two and a half years, how much were you making at that point? Base salary, $296,000. And you say base salary, did you get any bonuses, commissions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And how much was that roughly? 800000 So on top of the 296000 you made in commission bonuses, another additional $800,000? That was in 2021. In 2020, maybe more cl closer to 650 in bonuses. Okay. And then uh, in 2022? 2022, I incorporated... No, I have that backwards. 2021 was the 650. 2022 was the eight. Okay. So in 2022, on top of your base salary of 296000 you made an additional $800,000. Is that correct? Approximately, yes. Approximately. Okay. And then in 2021, what was your base salary then? Was that still two ninety six? No, my base salary was a, a little lighter than that. I think that was at the two seventy five. Okay, so then your base salary in twenty twenty one was two seventy five, and then you made in addition to that bonuses of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is that correct? Approximately, yes. Okay, and then so we're looking at the last th 2019, 2021, 22. So uh, roughly four years, correct? You four made. Years. 275 between 275,000 to 296,000 in base salaries and anywhere between 650 to 800,000 in bonuses. Not over a four year span, no. When we just reviewed my tax returns, the 2020, if I can recall, was 400,000 all in or 400 and some change. And then the next two years were 901.2 respectively. Okay. Now, when you left Equifax, when did you leave Equifax? Uh, that was approximately November, December of 2021-ish. Well, you said in 2022 at Equifax, you made over $800,000. Yeah. Okay. Then I transitioned to Nucella. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me get my numbers right. So 2022 of March, I started with Newzella. So my last paycheck with Equifax was February of 2022. That's about right. So March 2022 until you're saying September of 2022, you were at Newzella? Correct. 
And so when you started there, how much were you, what was your base salary? With New Zello? Yes. 300,000. And did you make any bonuses within that time frame? Yes. Think about 50,000. And why did, well, well, why did you leave New Zella? New Zella was a job elimination. It was a uh, ed tech company. I was hired in as the first senior VP in the company. It was an expansion role. Uh, there were issues surrounding CRT and some of the red states and Florida, Texas, and others stopped doing business in New Zella and they had massive layoffs. Okay. And did you receive a severance pay? Uh, I guess it depends on how you define severance. Uh, I was let go in November, I'm sorry, September the 15th, and they kept me on payroll through December. So they didn't give me like a severance, they just kept me on payroll for that period of time. So, so New Zella, technically speaking, you worked from March of 2022 until November of 2022. Is that correct? Well, technically being on their payroll to the close of December of 2022. December of 2022. Okay. So you weren't actually unemployed as far as income based in September. That did not take place until roughly January of 2023 then, correct? From a, from a payment standpoint, I was still paid but unemployed. And at any, can you tell me what year, if you recall, was the last time you made under um, $275,000? Do you recall? That would be 2018, 2017, 2017. So roughly consistently from 2017 until November, excuse me, December of 2022, you've made more than 275,000. From December of 2022, did you say? Yes, that that's when was your last payment with Nuzella, correct? Yeah, but are you asking me, have I, you're asking when's the last time I made less than 275, I thought was the question. Right, and you said 2017, correct? Correct. So from 2017 until December of 2022, right. There's been no employment that you've had that you've made less than $275,000, correct? I don't think I made two seventy five dollars in 2018, as okay. I think. Yeah, so 2019 would be a better account, 2019 forward. And so at the time of the modification, this modification in 2022, you had your income had increased from 2019. Is that correct? From this modification, yes. Now I want to jump over to the children's needs. It have you specifically spoken to anyone as far as the evaluators relating to any of the um, educational needs um, that has been addressed today? Uh, I've spoken to uh, Alexandra. Hoke. Uh, and we talked through uh, the challenges that the, the kids uh, have. Uh, and my request was to have biweekly conversations to be updated. Uh, she was not able to commit to that. So she told me every four to six weeks, she'd give me a comprehensive uh, write up on how the kids are progressing. Okay. So and how that, many that conversations? Okay. Pause. And how, when did, when did you have this conversation with Ms. Hoke? I can't give you the exact date, uh, but I want to say this was sometime in September-ish. September-ish of last year? 2023, yes. And September of last year was when we were going to court. We were supposed to originally have the final hearing. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Okay. So prior to September of 2023, you've never had a conversation with Ms. Hulk? No. And is there a reason why? Uh, I wasn't aware of Ms. Hulk. Are you? You were in receipt of the reports for her, for their occupational therapy. Is that correct? Uh, some of them. I didn't take note of her na name. I just read the reports. Okay. And so is there any reason why after reading the reports and the recommendations, you did, you did not follow up and inquire about those recommendations and some of the things that were mentioned as far as needs or services? There, there were attempts. We, we had some phone tag challenges before we got in, finally got in contact. Okay. And when were those attempts? I don't know the exact date. Okay. It was prior so, to, obviously, to the first time we spoke. So the first time you received the first report for Grayson was November of 2022. So I'm trying to get a gauge 
on when you started those attempts as far I, as understanding. I, def I definitely didn't reach out to her anytime in 2022. I, I don't know the exact date that I started reaching out to her. And you have financially been reimbursing Ms. Fowler for these occupational services. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, have you reached out to Grayson or Hendricks teachers to see how they're doing as far as school and progressing in school? Have not. Why? Just don't, don't have a good answer for it. Is so I'm going to kind of take it stage by stage. So you haven't reached out. Did you reach out in 2023? I reached out to Ms. Hoke in 2023. Okay, but no, no school personnel, correct? No. Okay, and so how are you? Um, how do you know what exactly their needs are as far as school choices? If you have not spoken to any of their providers, how do I know their needs and school choices? No, strike that. Miss Fowler provided you with a list of school choices, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you reach out and communicate with any of the schools or get collateral information on what the schools offered? No, I haven't spoken to any of the schools. Okay. Is there a reason why? There hasn't been a, I, for, for, in my mind, I, I'm looking at, is there a potential remedy in public schools before I go heavy and say what the best private school is? Okay. So what public schools have you reached out to, to explore if there's I, any appropriate remedies? I haven't reached out to any, from what I understand, DeKalb is a, is a good fit and has the potential of meeting the kids' needs. I'm sorry, which one? DeKalb, the one that Grayson was accepted to. D DeKalb? What'd you say? He's saying, what are you saying is DeKalb? He's sorry. calling DeKalb. That's okay. <clears throat> That's correct. What what school in DeKalb? I thought I had it here in my notes. I don't have the name of it committed to memory. When did you reach out to the school? No, I did not reach out to the school. I had looked up some stuff online to see what type of resources were available. And based upon dialogue that I had with my attorney, uh, my understanding that the club was a public uh, potential alternative for the, for the kids. The, the cab is a county. So when you say the cab, the court and I am inquiring into what specific schools in the cab have you explored in your research in order to determine whether or not there was an appropriate remedy, as you stated, in public schools. There, there is a school in DeKalb that I can't seem to find it in my notes. That's what I was looking for. That's why I keep referring to it as DeKalb. I can't, DeKalb. I can't seem to locate. I wasn't prepared for that question. And I know I have it here in my notes somewhere. You weren't prepared to address the educational needs today? The, no, the question relative to the name of the school okay. with, in DeKalb. Okay. And I believe we addressed it, but child care expenses. Did Ms. Fowler address with you the need to have some additional assistance based on you not visiting and needing to be able to have some weekends, weeknights and work and do all the things and needing additional supports for child care expenses? Um, she mentioned yeah. some of that, yes. And my, my response was, I'm, I'm not working. I don't have the extra money to do that right now. Do you not recall your response, in fact, being, I'm not going to pay anything that I'm not ordered to pay? Uh, that was part of the conversation after it got heated. It wasn't that stand standalone because she didn't like my answer when I said it wasn't in the budget. So things got a little heated and I did say that. Okay. And do you recall when that conversation was? I don't. Would May of 2022 sound familiar? No. Okay. And if it was, in fact, May of 2022, you were, in fact, employed at that time, correct? That is the reason why I said I don't recall that in 2022. I remember that, that conversation, as I recall it, that it happened when I was unemployed. I'm looking for that so that way we could keep going. Do you recall when the when she got an impair in place as far as the boys? I don't remember the date, no. Did she provide you with the documentation for that? Yes. Okay, do you recall when, what year that was provided? I don't recall the exact time or year. And, you know, I, I did, as petitioners exhibit 20, I do have the au pair expenses, um, if I could just have one moment, Your Honor, to, to go to petitioner. It was previously tendered into evidence as Petitioner's Exhibit 20, and it's the au pair expenses. Does, does any of these documents look familiar to you, um, Mr. Gibson?
a little bit. Okay. And do you see where it says placement date being July 7th, 2022? Could you hover your arrow, arrow over it? Yes, right here. Thank you. Yes. And ending July 2023? Yes. Okay. And so you recall her having communications with you about the need for an au pair, correct? Yes. And you recall, do you now recall seeing these documentations from 2022? Yes. Okay. And so at that point, you just testified that the reason why you couldn't afford those expenses was because you were not employed. However, you just testified that you did not, technically speaking, no longer have income until January of 2023. So, so was there a reason why you could not provide, or you were not um, willing to provide any assistance? Now, now that I speak, yeah. Now that I, I must have been referring, thinking of a different conversation because I didn't link what you just asked me to the exact readout that she had from an au pair quote. Uh, at that, at that time. Uh, I wasn't comfortable absorbing the extra cost associated with the, with an au pair. It was not my budget. But you were also not comfortable with exercising your court ordered visitation as well. Is that correct? Objection. Mm -hmm. As asked and answered. Sustained. How much have you paid so far in attorney's fees, if you recall? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 20000 And do you recall how much you paid the first time for your case as far as attorney's fees? Objection relevance. That is a prior action. What's the relevance? Your Honor, I think it's appropriate. Mr. Gibson mentioned earlier that he intends to file another modification relating to potentially this same course of matters. And so to understand what he paid now in attorney's fees and was previously was paid in attorney's fees, Your Honor, I believe is absolutely irrelevant. Relevant, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to sustain the objection. And so, so far you paid twenty thousand dollars. Is that correct? Approximately. Okay. And have you ever had an opportunity to speak to Miss Blankenstein? No. And at some point, were you building a house um, in Atlanta or in Missouri? No. Did you have plans to build a house in Atlanta or Missouri? Missouri, uh, no. In Atlanta, at one point, I did have plans to, eat, to either buy or build. Yes. And do you ever have any intentions of moving back to the state of Georgia? It's possible, yes. And I say possible because if employment doesn't allow me to do that and ask me to reside somewhere else, and that would compromise that a bit. So your decision to move back to Georgia would be contingent on solely employment, not the children, correct? No. I'm saying at this point, in order to be able to provide, I need a job. So the job would be the priority right now, although I would like to move back to Atlanta. Okay. And so is there a reason why you cannot provide if you have $110,000 in an MMM account? Yes, because currently I don't have a job and I'm currently spending down what I have to co cover what I need to cover in expenses. Okay. And those expenses are $13,000, correct? Approximately. Asked and answered. And as far as your... I think you That's froze. Okay. And oh, as far Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. And as far as do you have any other children? No. Do you are you currently married? No. Do you have any other dependents? Not that I claim. Okay. Do you live with anyone outside of yourself within your home? What do you mean? What do you mean not that you claim? Well, meaning I have uh, relatives that from time to time I have a sister that struggles a bit. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Does your sister live with you? No. Do you live alone? Yes. And you are asking the court today to grant your downward deviation in child support. Is that correct? Correct. So you're asking the court to reduce your child support from $1,500? No. Uh, it's a downward deviation relative to percentage. My actual amount would go up. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Cross. I mean, uh, well, I guess you'll um, have them in your case in chief. Um, so do you have any additional witnesses, Ms. Hanson? Your Honor, I do not have any okay. additional witnesses at this time, Your Honor. If I just, again, get one second just to make sure I'm going through the exhibit list. Not at this time, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Tyler, you can call Mr. Gibson. Oh, I'm sorry. Who are you calling first? 
I'm calling Mr. Gibson. That's okay. Correct. All right. Mr. Gibson, um, there was a previous action between you and Ms. Fowler, the 2019 action. Correct. Okay. And what is your child support obligation pursuant to that order? Child support is 1584 a month. Are you current on child support? 100%. Great. Out of pocket medicals, what percentage do you pay? 60%. Are you current? 100%. Uh, for work related child care? 60% capped at 2000. Okay. Um, you moved after the order was entered into in 2019. Correct. correct. And where did you move? You moved to Missouri at that time? Yes. And was that because of a new employment position? Yes. Have you worked in various places in the United States throughout your job history? Yes. New Jersey, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio, Georgia, now St. Louis. So it's not unusual for you to have a move related to a job? Not at all. Okay. Let's discuss your job history. Um, what is your area of expertise? Sales leadership. Okay. And how long have you been in that field? In sales, about 30 years, sales leader, leadership, 25 years at a number of different levels. Okay. And you testified your most recent employment position was with Newzella, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you, you worked for one other company in 2022 prior to that, that was Equifax? Correct. Okay. Um, that position, your Equ Equifax position ended when? About three, three and a half months prior to Newzella. So that okay. puts it like mid-November. Okay. And you started with Newzella when? March 1 of 2022. Okay. And when did that position end? My last official day was the 15th of September. However, uh, I was on the payroll until the 31st of December. Okay. But you were not working between September 15th when you were laid off and December 31st of 2023 or, or 2022, yes. excuse me. That is correct. Okay. And tell us why did that position end with Newzella? Yes, Newzella uh, was an is an ed tech company. Uh, I was hired in as a as their first senior vice president of sales as an expansion role. Uh, it wasn't contemplated at the time that CRT would, would become such a hot topic, and we had significant revenue erosion over time. And the C suite made decisions that they needed to uh, reduce headcount and eliminate some positions. Mine was one of them. Okay, so you did not quit your job. No. no. All right, and. Your last official day uh, with Newzella, this was before you were served with Ms. Fowler's petition, correct? I believe so, yes. And you testified earlier that you earned about $1.2 million from income from Newzella and Equifax in 2022, correct? That is correct. All right. Break down for me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ms. Fowler. I need to take one quick second again. Okay, no problem. May I run to the restroom too? I'm yes, you may. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get started. I think that's a general consensus, Your Honor. <laughs> yeah, but now, I'm, where's my pen? Okay, I found it. All right. All right, let's go. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Gibson, we were just uh, having you testify regarding your position with Muzella and Equifax and where we were at was those were the only two companies that you worked for in 2022, correct? That is correct. Okay. And can I you spell Newzella again? I'm sorry. That's okay. Is That's it spell it? N-E-W-S-E-L-A. Okay. Can you break down the 1.2 million that you received in total in 2022 for us, like in terms of salary, bonus, total compensation? Yeah. So uh, it was a combination of a base salary that I had for two months in 2022 oh. with Equifax at 296,000. So you divide that by 12, that was January, February. Right. Nuzella hired me in at a base salary of $300,000. You do that math and divide it by 10 because I worked, I was paid for 10 months with Newzella in 2022. Okay, the way let me pause there for just a moment. So to clarify, your base at Equifax was 250-ish and your base at- 296. 296. Yes. Your base at Newzella was 300. 
Correct. Okay. And so obviously you had income in addition to that base. Tell us about that. Right. So uh, for 2021, the way that Equifax compensates is they take your base salary, half of your base salary is considered your bonus target. So if in fact you hit your bonus target for the year, for math simplicity, you could earn another $150,000. So again, for math simplicity, let's just say Equifax is a $300,000 base and I delivered against my target, that would be another 150. So I would make $450,000 that year. Okay. Equifax had a, had a very aggressive overachieving compensation plan. Uh, and my performance hit every escalator to max it. And that final bonus, which was somewhere around six, seven hundred thousand dollars somewhere in that neighborhood, was paid out in Q1 for perf- Q1 of 2022 for performance relative to 2021. So that was part of the 1.2 million. The base salary for two months with Equifax, along with my final end year payout, and then the rest of those dollars were attributed to Nazella and approximately $50,000 in bonus that I earned with them. So that math, without being exact, that you fall that into a knot, that's your 1.2 million. Okay, understood. Um, was this an unusual year for you with regard to your total income? Incredibly unusual. Uh, you, you got a chance to see my last three uh, tax returns, not including 2023. And you take a look at 2022 and 2021, those were the blowout years. And you can take a look at any time in my history. I've never made half that much. The close, closest to it was 2020 when I made $400,000. Now, the, the uniqueness of making that kind of money were due to macro conditions, meaning ec- the economic environment. And if you remember, COVID was at its peak in 2021 and 2022. And the line of business, which I had five of them, but my largest line of business was a $100 million line of business that my comp was linked directly directly to called unemployment claims management. So the way that I had my staff build out expiring contracts back in 2019, along with changes in leadership and upscaling the sales force, unbeknownst to us, COVID hit and our unemployment business for two years went through the roof. That was the reason why I was able to hit the escalators. And just to add more context to it, my predecessor who ran my business unit for four consecutive years, the business shrunk four consecutive years. That's why they sought uh, a new hire and bought me on board. Okay. So highly unusual. Did you improve upon your predecessor's uh, work with the company? I did, for sure. Uh, in large part, uh, certainly, you know, with the changing of the sales talent and, and bringing in different leaders, but certainly the economic conditions along with the way we wrote contracts really benefited us. Okay. Um, do you expect you'll ever earn 1.2 in a year ever again? I, it, it would, it, it would have to be, a, a, another lightning in a bottle scenario. Uh, when you have, uh, something that you can't account for like COVID and how that's, that's a once in a century type of a deal. So uh, as I mentioned, you take a look at my history. I've never made half that much relative to my 2021 W2 and my 2022 W2 slash tax return. I've never made half that much. And prior to 2019, I was making you know slightly over two hundred thousand dollars, and before that, it was the high hundred and seventies, high hundred eighties. Okay. You are doing some contract work, correct? Correct. Okay, and there was some testimony about how you were sent those uh, potential clients earlier. You, you said you receive about one to two a week. Um, you don't qualify for all of the jobs that you receive. I do not. When those, when those, when the companies like GuidePoint, Third Bridge, these are consulting firms, and when they have a client that can that connects with them with an inquiry for a level of expertise that they need to be consulted on, GuidePoint, Third Bridge, and others will go and take a look in their database and and get a feel for who they think will qualify. They then send an inquiry to me and other private contractors, ten nine employees that are subject matter experts. We would then answer all of the questions and list the credentials and what we know about the subject, submit that back to GuidePoint, for instance. GuidePoint will collect half dozen, if you will, send it to the client. The client will say, out of all of these, we want to speak to this person. If I'm that person, GuidePoint contacts me, sends me uh, a calendar and asks for three different times or dates uh, that I can meet. 
and we schedule the appointment. We agree upon the hourly fee and away we go. So you don't, you don't necessarily, you're not guaranteed the jobs when they come in. No, not at all. Not at all. I'm just one to be considered. So it's not a matter of you picking and choosing the jobs. No, no, not at all. all. The only, the only picking and choosing I do is if I want to apply for it and they have a category, if you decline and they give you the reason why, and if it's outside of my scope and I don't feel I can add value to the client, that would be a situation in which I would decline. Okay. You, how much are you, would you say you average from the contract uh, work that you're doing per month right now? I would say on average, it's probably around 400, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. There's not, not every project is at the top of the scale. Some of them are lower. Okay. And I, for uh, the sake of expediency, um, I'd like to tender our six into evidence. Um, if there's no objection, I, I will go ahead and do so. If Ms. Hinkson wants me to lay the foundation, I can do that as well. These are just screenshots of uh, his contract work payments that were provided in discovery. You said this is D6? It's uh, R6. R6. All right, Ms. Hinkson. No objections, Your Honor. All right, so admit it. Thank you, Judge. Um, okay, so you've not worked for any company other than doing contract work in 2023, correct? That is correct. All right. Do you intend to become employed? Absolutely. All right. And how long have you been looking for a job? Uh, since the 15th of September in 2022. Okay. And about how many jobs? Well, let me back up. What efforts have you made to find a job? Several. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been north of 280 uh, jobs that I've applied for on LinkedIn alone. There's been to a lesser degree uh, based upon uh, the profile of jobs that, that have been made available on LinkedIn. Expert tier is another resource that I use and uh, work very uh, aggressively with my recruiter, recruiter slash recruiting firms. And I would just say, you know, it'd be a lot easier of a time if I was willing to take a job that's, you know, significantly less than than the, the role that uh, I feel that I'm a fit for in my most recent experience. But um, I just haven't gone aggressively applying for those jobs. It's been the jobs that fit my skill set today and the jobs that I've been in in the past. And in addition, uh, it's become a, a lot more tougher, uh, you know, being an African American at fifty six and a protected class, I found that to be a little bit more of a challenge. But we still remain aggressive, trying trying to secure an opportunity. And when you refer to your skill set, um, you have do you have a very pr- special skill set? Well, it was a very special skill set as being an, a senior vice president in, in a sales environment, uh, and that skill set revolves around uh, operations management, uh, marketing management, uh, client service management, sales training management along with uh, running a sales organization and being responsible for PL. I'd like to tender uh, R19 into evidence. It is uh, screenshots of my client's job applications on LinkedIn, which was provided to Ms. Hinkson. Um, I will certainly lay the foundation if I need to, if there's no, if there's an objection. Any objection, Ms. Hinkson? No objections, Your Honor. So let me do. Thank you. All right, so the jobs on LinkedIn that you've applied to, you said you've applied to what, 280 plus? Yeah. Okay. What types of jobs are these? These are sales yeah. leadership roles. Uh, so you have you have different titles that that sometimes can reflect the same same job description. So a chief revenue officer at one company is another company's senior vice president, and in some instances, a company's senior vice president is another company's vice president. So uh, all of them have the the same type of requisite skills to be able to do the job well. So although you may see some title differences. For the most part, the job descriptions and the responsibilities are the same. The other difference would be uh, the scope relative to how many people that you're supporting in the organization, along with the revenue that you're responsible for. Those would be the two major drivers uh, relative to how a job might be compensated. So when you see a base salary that I provide a range to, those would be the things that I would actually consider for it to make sense. Okay. What is the base salary range for these these jobs that you've been applying to? ones that I've been applying for has been about 150 to 200. In some instances, you'll see a 225, 250, but for the most part, it's been in that range. Okay. Now, if I would also say if you, I haven't had, although I've looked uh, at websites for different companies that haven't come through LinkedIn that have offered more, but within the 280 plus that I've been looking at, that's the range. Right. And could you get a job making less than what you previously made? 
I'd be overqualified, but the answer to your question is yes. And why wouldn't you take that kind of job? Uh, I think the optics of it probably wouldn't be good. The narrative uh, may be uh, I'm looking to take any old job just to pay less in child care, child support. Uh, and at the same time, I do want to be in an opportunity that, that I want to sustain and, and want to do the work. Uh, however, uh, the more I eat into my savings, uh, certainly you don't want to go broke and not have a job at all. That, that would be a consideration down the line. Okay. Um, what base salary do you expect that you'll be able to earn when you get a job? I, I would feel confident that, that I should be able to get to the, get to 150. I, I, I feel confident about that. It would be uh, a major disappointment for me if I had to sell for something less. Okay. Does that 150 include commissions? Does not. Okay. And tell us, do commission structures vary company by company? Without a doubt. I can speak directly to, to that, having worked for five or six different Fortune 500 companies. And the comp, comp design, I've been involved with comp design, vary by what the goals of the organization are. Uh, some companies feel that they pay aggressively on base salary and not very aggressive uh, when it comes to variable comp. Uh, and the escalators just aren't there to really, you know, maximize a, a comp plan. You have other companies that, you know, uh, may get a little skinny when it comes to base salary, but very aggressive on a variable comp. Other companies may, particularly if they're not publicly traded and they're privately held, uh, compensate aggressively on stock options. Although they're not, they're not worth anything unless the company goes public, but that's, that's kind of the hook to get you, uh, uh, interested because if in fact you are with one of those companies they do go public then you know certainly you can make a lot of money overnight uh, and then you've got companies that you know pay pay from a performance standpoint through restricted stock units and put them on a vesting schedule so uh a lot of it has to do with the revenue that's associated uh with what you're responsible for that drives the base salary along with the variable comp so if you're you know a google for for instance or an amazon where you may be responsible for a billion dollar p l Certainly, that's going to be different if you're working for a non-public company and the PNL is 100 million. So, is there any guaranteed commission that you could expect? Never. I've uh, worked for companies on on both sides where uh, I've had a base salary and grew to business 10 percent, and because the growth ambitions were much more aggressive, I didn't make any bonus. So, it's possible you can go through a year and not make any, and you can have a year where you blow the number out, and then the following year the grow over on the performance you had year prior could put you in a compromised position where you, you don't bonus as aggressively as you did the year before. Uh, that's why, you know, sales is, is a, and I, I know it as a profession, it's, it's incredibly volatile in terms of ups and downs. Understood. Okay. Um, have you received a 2023 W2? I have. When did you receive it? I received it on Saturday, this past Saturday. Judge, I'm going to share my screen um, and show the witness what's been marked as R36. Did you say 2023, 2022, or 2023? 2023. Okay. Go ahead. Is this a true and correct copy of your 2023 W2? That is correct. Okay. And I judge I moved to enter R36 in evidence. So admit it. Um, I'm sorry. Any objections? No objections, Your Honor. All right. R36. So admit it. Okay, and what is your your wages total wages right here, Walter? That's two hundred and thirty thousand five hundred and ten, and I believe that's seventy four cents if I'm reading it correctly. Okay. And what is that income from? That income is from RSUs. Uh, those are RSUs that were granted uh, back in twenty twenty one that did not vest until twenty twenty three, if my memory serves me correctly. That was not income from actual employment, though, correct? No, that was not employment income. That was a uh, var variable comp based upon the 2021 year performance. Okay. What did you do with those RSUs? Uh, those RSUs were budgeted for my tax liability uh, that I had for my performance in 2022. Okay. Um, the, what, what happens... And, and why my tax liability was so aggressive caught me by surprise and it caught, well, didn't catch my accountant by surprise. He was surprised that I had that type of year that I had. But um, when, you, when you're compensated, your salary goes into the system. And based upon what your salary is, you fall into a particular tax bracket. And that tax bracket is 
is held throughout the course of the year. And the system doesn't comprehend when you plug in bonuses, how that can take you into a different tax bracket. So stated differently, if you're 300,000 and you're in a tax bracket of 32%, and over the course of the year, you have a $1.2 million year with bonuses, you're still at that 32% until you go reconcile with your accountant and you're supposed to be at 37%. And then you've got this huge federal tax bill that you need to pay for. And that's what my RSUs are used for that year. Okay. Um, even though you're currently not employed, are you willing to impute yourself an income consistent with your 2023 W-2? I am. Okay. So if we use that as your income, that is a gross monthly income of 19209 per month? Yes. Okay. And is that what you, you've used on your proposed child support worksheet? Yes. Okay. Your gross monthly income pursuant to your 2019 child support worksheet was what? Do you recall? The income, I think it was 246000 somewhere in that neighborhood. Was it 20533 per month? That sounds about right. Yeah, I think if you that math squares. Okay. And Judge, I'd like to tender R3 in evidence. That is our proposed child support worksheet. No objection. What was that? What was that, what was that number? R3. Okay. <clears throat> Um, let's talk about the kids' medical insurance and out-of-pocket costs. Um, you previously agreed to cover the kids in the 2019 order, correct? You did. Okay. And you did, in fact, cover the kids up until, what, last year? Yes. Okay. When you became unemployed, did you obtain a medical insurance policy for the kids? Yes. Was there a gap in coverage? No. Did Ms. Fowler propose to you that she put the kids on her plan? Yes. And did you agree? Yes. Okay, so she's and probably covering. And, and just, to, just to be clear, when, when I say there was no gap in coverage, that is partially correct. Meaning when I transitioned from one insurance plan to the other, there was a gap. However, once the system was updated, all outstanding claims were, were satisfied. Okay, so it was like a retroactive to cover. Correct. Okay. correct. Are you current on all your obligation for out-of-pocket medical expenses to Ms. Fowler? Yes. What distribution are you asking the court to order with regard to payment of out-of-pocket medical expenses today? 50-50. Are you current on your obligation for work-related childcare expenses to Ms. Fowler? Yes. Okay, and remind us what your current obligation is. Current obligation is 60% with a $2,000 cap. Um, do you recall anything specific in your child support addendum from 2019 with regard to private school? Yes. In the 2019, it was in the agreement that, um, I would not, uh, be forced to pay for private school. Judge, I'm going to share my screen. I'm sharing R14, which was previously admitted by a petitioner. I'm not sure what number though it was, uh, but it's the 2019 child support addendum. Can you read us the last, can you read us uh, section nine out loud? Yes. Mother's designation is having final decision-making authority on extracurricular activity expenses. Private school shall in no way obligate father to pay for private school or extracurricular activities without father's prior written consent to the same. In the event the father does agree to contribute to the cost of the particular particular extracurricular activity expenses or private school expenses, the party shall split the cost of the same on a 50-50 basis or as otherwise agreed upon by the parties. Have there been times where you have overpaid for work-related childcare costs? Uh, I believe that I have. Uh, and the reason I believe it and I haven't heard anything to the contrary was I was reviewing um, prior tax returns uh, that Ms. Fowler had submitted. And when I took a look at the work related child expenses, it did not square with what it was I was paying. Did you address it with her? I shot Ms. Fowler an email, uh, indicating that I felt that I overpaid and, uh, I was subject to reimbursement for, you know, the differences and, uh, I never got a response. <clears throat> Was there any sort of discussion between you and Ms. Fowler pertaining to how your portion of work-related childcare should be applied? Yes. Um, 
in, initially it was for uh, an Annie. Um, Ms. Fowler uh, then engaged in a conversation with me and asked, would I be comfortable in a preschool scenario to have the boys go to private school? And the way that it was packaged to me is that she felt that we could get more bang for the buck as opposed to me paying $2,000 for the nanny. Uh, we can get the kids a head start on education in private school. And I would be able to do that. And it wouldn't cost me anything extra, just the same $2,000 that I was paying. Uh, we also had the conversation that this was in no way obligating. This was just until they were of age to be able to go to public school. Okay. So you agreed essentially that you would apply the 2000 to the Suzuki school tuition instead of to a nanny. Correct. Because the child care would be, be getting taken care of and they'd be getting a head start on some additional education that the nanny wouldn't be able to provide. And it was packaged as a better bank, bank for the buck. And I agreed to that. Okay. And do you speak with anyone in Ms. Fleck, Fleckenstein's office regarding the kids care? Uh, the only person that I spoke to and I exchanged uh, emails with would be Alexandra Hoke. Ms. Fowler is contending that public school is not sufficient for the kids. Um, do you agree that public school is not sufficient to meet the kids' needs? I, 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 I can't say that I agree because uh, the vetting hasn't been comprehensive to understand comprehensively uh, what other options in the public sector are. Okay. What distribution are you asking the court to order with regard to the payment of work-related child care costs today? It would be a 50-50 split with, with a cap. Okay. And are you asking for a cap like you did in the 2019 order? Yes. What cap are you asking for? I don't have that spreadsheet in front of me. It's, it was less than the 2000. It was, was it 1300? Are you asking for maybe half of what she's listed on her financial affidavit with regard to child care? Yeah, approximately. Okay. So about $1,023 per month? Yeah. Are you asking that the court order this obligation outside of child support? Yes. Do you have the ability to pay for private school tuition? Uh, at this point with no income, I would say it would be very uncomfortable. If you are ordered to contribute to private school tuition today, what distribution are you asking the court to order for payment of private school expenses? It would be 50-50 with, with a cap. Okay. And what would that cap be? I wish I had the spreadsheet. I don't have those numbers memorized. That's okay. Could it be half of the cost of the lowest? That is exactly what it is. Half the cost of the lowest uh, option that we have out of the ones that were listed. Okay. And that's approximately $3,889 per month. Right. And I think the all-in number was somewhere around 4600 Have you paid for any expenses uh, requested by Ms. Fowler that you're not obligated to pay for? Yes. Yes, uh, I found it interesting that, that it wasn't recalled, but I got called directly about uh, an issue in her new home with, with the fr uh, furnace. And I certainly can produce the check or the PayPal transaction to support that, but it was for $1,800. Uh, and then on top of it, uh, when I came to visit the boys and we were playing out in the backyard, I noticed that there were a lot of rocks and things. And I know kids run around and they fall and I thought it was kind of dangerous. And I asked her, uh, would she, as she looked at a artificial turf, turf option. Uh, and then she said that uh, she did. And she said, but it was cost prohibitive. And then I asked her what, what was the cost? And she said, 12, five, 13,000. And then I said uh, that, you know, if I covered half of what the expense would be, if, what the expense would be, would, would that be helpful? She then said, yes. And I said, well, let's do this. How about we vet three different vendors and take a look at it. Tell me which one you think uh, is the best option and we'll do it. And that's what she did. How much was the, your portion of the turf? $6,000. How much did you pay for the furnace? $1,800. If you have the ability, do you intend to contribute above and beyond what you're ordered to contribute? Without a doubt. I've, I've absolutely demonstrated that. That's why I'm like, when I say, Hey, I don't have it in the budget. Why that seems to be like sideways look. Do you intend to retire at any point? I hope so. <laughs> at 56, I uh, don't know how many more years I got left, but I'd say at least 10. Okay. And you've spent about 20000 in attorney's fees? Yes. Um, nothing further subject to redirect. 
All right, I'm missing some of you can cross them, but please, all new information. Yes, Your Honor. So you mentioned as far as your 2023 W-2, that that was roughly $230,000. Is that correct? Yes. Did you in any way factor in the independent contracting jobs that you did into that overall budget or, or monthly income? No. Okay. Did you factor in any of the money market accounts or any of the E-Trade accounts into that income? I never looked at that as income. That was a question I had before. I didn't recognize that an investment account that you're not getting funds out of is considered income because it's growing. Okay. And in that amount that you received as far as the independent contractor, you list five different places. Is that correct? That you you do independent contract work for? I listed four, but there may be five, there may be six. Those are the ones that are off the top of my head that I know I work with the most. Okay. And did you provide any 1099s relating to that for your income of 2023? 1099s and W-2s aren't legally supposed to be mailed out uh, at the latest, the 31st of January. So the 1099s have not been produced by these entities as of yet. I have not received. And what do you anticipate, if you recall, from each of those 1099 receiving as far as what they would show as far as your year to end date from 2023? I won't be able to tell because if I can recall correctly, a 1099 is only produced if in fact you've done over $750 in business with that entity over the course of a year. And there are a few of them that I have not done that with. So I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't tabulated the actual companies and what I've made with all of them. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Nothing further, Judge. I, I have one question, Mr. Gibson. You indicated that you do you cannot agree um, that not going to public school is in the best interest because you said there hasn't been compre it hasn't been comprehensive enough. What do you mean by that? I said we have, I haven't, or we haven't comprehensively vetted the public school opportunities for me to say that that's not an option. In other and words, but what is the comprehensive that you're looking for? Meaning ha having the conversation around, you know, things that would be consistent with what would be considered a good opportunity in a public school, like size, size of the school. Do they offer an IEP plan? Do they offer a 504 plan? Things that the kids are going to need in order to progress and be successful. Okay. And did, were you aware that the issues were coming up today related to that? Uh, I would say after listening to Mrs. Freckenstein, I have a much better understanding. So high level, yes, but a much better understanding after listening to her testimony. Did you not understand that majority of what you were, you were dealing with with regard to these numbers had to do with what was investing to the child children because of their disability? Oh, I understand that that is definitely the outcome we're looking for. And, and I'm interested in that outcome. I, I just want to be sure that the public school route is the only option and the best option. When do you anticipate being sure? Well, part, part of the exercise after getting out of this hearing as we move forward is to do the due diligence to understand what's available on the, on the, on the public side. So what, what am I going to be doing if you're doing that? I mean, what I'm trying to say is today is the day. There, there is no other chance to do that. If your concern is about being comprehensive, you should have been using your your time since September to figure out the differences so that you could come here today and convince me and say, Your Honor, public isn't working. Here's the reason why. Or the public will work. And here's the reason why. You can get a he 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 qualifies for the um, 504 or he has an IEP and I've spoken with the school and here are the resources that they would have, they, they could give us with the IEP. They have OTs at the school. Here's how many days a week the OT could come in. Though that is the comprehensive that you should have been doing. Why would you come here, tell me it's not comprehensive and then say, I'm gonna figure it out later as if I'm not gonna make a decision today. Uh, my, my view on comprehensive is a lot different exiting this conversation than it was before getting on this call today. So you didn't think that the issue was going to be about public school or private school? No, I, I, I thought the issue would be there. I didn't have as comprehensive of, as an understanding as I do now versus getting on this call today. What's the difference? Having an opportunity to listen to Mrs. Freckenstein, the expert. You, you didn't bother the caller before today? Well, I, I spoke with Alexandra Hoke and looking at her evals and they weren't as comprehensive of what she articulated today. The written eval you're saying was not as comprehensive as what Miss 
not as what I heard. In fact, the, the evals that I read from Alexandra Hoke left me with a more optimistic feel than what I heard from Mrs. Freckenstein today. Oh, okay. That's okay. That makes sense. Um, I said I was going to go to eight. It's eight, which means we got to stop. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we have to do closings another day. Two ways we could do it. You can come back or you can write it. What do you want to do? Um, when would you have availability to come back? I don't know. Ms. Marshall, we'll have to take a look at it and look at your schedules um, and then figure it out. I'm not sure. Um, and then tomorrow, Adam, I'm not sure. Um, let me see. No, ma'am. <laughs> uh, that's a no. <laughs> Your Honor, I guess my question would be if we submitted our <coughs> writing by Thursday, would we would Your Honor be able to give us a better understanding or, or make a ruling um by next week, possibly, Your Honor? And the reason why I'm asking again is because of the school choices and all the applications and all the things that are associated with this matter. And so um respectfully my client is under a little bit of a time crunch as far as making sure she has all the things done. So if we are able to submit it by Thursday, is it possible, Your Honor, to have? I'm just trying to think different <laughs> aspects of if this. I, it's with you. If you if I have to read it, it, it goes into a stack um, and I get to it when I get to it. If I set you, then after you give your closing, sometimes I, I feel comfortable to make, um, to make decisions right after the closings. Um, and probably this time I would, because if we reset, I'll have an opportunity to go through what you have. And so once you have your closing, I can make a ruling at that time because I usually like to have an opportunity to kind of let the, some of the evidence sit with me for a little bit um, before I make a decision. So um, if you want, I think it, if you get on the calendar, I think that would probably give you the better opportunity to get it done rather than writing it out because when it's written out, I have so many other writings in front of yours um, and it'll take me a moment to get through it. So I'm not opposed, obviously, Your Honor, to get back on your calendar. I just think we just it's just a matter of, I guess, figuring out a date, Your Honor. Right. So Ms. Marshall will be in contact with you. We'll, I, I'd like to do it faster than, I mean, um, I would like to do it as quickly as possible. How much time do you think you need for closing? 20 minutes at max. Okay. Yeah. I agree. So that probably get it on um, fairly soon. I got to let Ms. Marshall sink in it for a little bit. And I'm sure she's not trying to do that at eight o'clock tonight. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, forgive me, Your Honor. Is that 20 minutes each, each. side? Well, each you talk side. about 20 minutes each side, right? Yes. So we're saying less than an hour. For yeah. Both, yeah. For, for a total. Maybe even less than that. Maybe 30 minutes total. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so you could look, consider an 8:30 somewhere, Miss Marshall. See what you look. Find your, excuse me. Find an 8:30 somewhere, or maybe we could do a one o'clock. Um, so I could just eat until lunch break somewhere from one to one thirty. Something like yes, that. What about, we'll do a 15 minute each. If you can do a 15 minute each, it'll get me. I can get you in somewhere. I think we can make that happen. I, I, okay. So, okay your Honor, one last thing. I, I apologize. Sure. Should we have leave of absences filed through the end of January? Yes. I will okay. say I have a ton of work for the next like three weeks. Um, so I'll just need some time to submit a conflict letter uh, in whatever case. So maybe if we could specially set this so it Oh, we don't have to say it. You're in the middle of the trial. It comes, oh. It'll come first because you're in the middle of it. Okay. But I mean, I can do especially. I can do the notice. Um, yeah. But you're in the middle of the trial, so it, it, it's going to take precedence. Okay. Unless it's something criminal. Yes. It, I don't have. So <laughs> I don't. Okay. You know, I will make myself available. I know my client wants this to to be resolved, so I will be at the mercy of the court relating a new date um, to get this matter resolved for her. I All believe right. the school choice period ends, I believe, by the end of this month, the beginning of next month, Your Honor. So again, if we could just get something, we that would be absolutely great. <laughs> well, we'll see. But if not, just apply for the school choice um, and kind of see where you where you land. It's not going to hurt you um, to just go ahead and do it. It might be a little tedious, but the, I have children in the cab and to do the school choices. Kind of hate doing the application, but it's you can get through. All right. Thank you. Y'all take care. And Your Honor, just for the record, the evidence is closed. Is that correct? And this is just for arguments of closing. Argument only, unless something kind of crazy happens in between. That's what we'll be arguing. Okay. 15 minutes each so I can stick you somewhere soon. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Marshall, we'll talk about it in the morning. You ain't got to call me tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Y'all take care. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye.